Nicola. Nicola. Yeah. We're, <laughs> sorry, I just practiced my power pose. Right. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Hello. Hi, and welcome again to our third Corporate Conundrums podcast. Looking forward to our morning this morning to see who calls us up and what exciting advice we can give back to them. I'm Nicola. I am Wendy. And welcome to Corporate Conundrums. Welcome to the new, improved Corporate Conundrums. What do you think? I think we're looking very professional. It's amazing what you can do with a cardboard cutout roll and box of Kellogg's cornflakes. That's not quite what I did, but Nicola, that's okay. I went to great uh, expense and time to find the perfect scenario because previously we had feedback. That yeah, our... shout out to Joanne. Shout out to Joanne Fairbrother. Thank you for this. Uh, Joanne thought we looked like we were sitting in an old folks home. Yes, or a waiting nursing to, home. Waiting to be admitted. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a more corporate image and we hope you like it. So I think we've got some callers coming in, Nicola. We do. We've got a Let's number. Kick off. Hello, thank you for calling Corporate Conundrums. How can we help you? It's Nicola and Wendy here. Oh, good morning, ladies. How are you today? We're good, thank you. Thank you very much. We're very well. Good, good. Listen, I wonder if you can help me with something. Um, uh, my name is Pam Shaw, and I've started my own consulting business, basically looking at freelancing work. And um, one of the things that to get my business off the ground is to be able to go out and network. Um, and I am looking at trying to get some advice about networking, not where to go, but I'm basically looking at um, it, it, when you're in a, a situation, um, how do you start conversations? Mm. That's always a difficult one. But also, um, if you happen to be speaking to someone um, and you're not sure, you need to disengage from them, I guess you could say. Um, so just wondering whether there were any tips about that as well and how we might be able to, um, once I've got information from them, move on to the next person. That, thanks, Pam. That's uh, definitely my bag, as I would say, being in communication. I actually do training in this um, network training, networking training. So for me, it's very much subliminal, um, non-obvious, unconscious body language, which I would okay. be tuning into. So I'd firstly say if you go into a networking room and you are not sure who to go and approach, the best first port of call would be around the coffee area where it's a more natural conversation. So you're not going up and being forced into conversation, but you can more naturally engage with each other in a conversation around about coffee. That would be my first port of call. Um, secondly, when you are then looking to engage a conversation with those that are already in huddles, either threes or twos, I'd very much be looking at the body language that they are offering when you walk up to them because you'll often see in a group of three people one person is a little disengaged already and that would be a good invitation for you to go in and introduce yourself if you notice subtleties like they're not facing each other in entirety perhaps their um, feet are in different positions and um, so that would be from an engagement point of view the, the first port of call have you got anything to add with that first part Nicola I personally um, I'm able to walk up to anybody, but I, I don't really enjoy it. I find it is quite nerve wracking and absolutely mm. um, being at the bar or the coffee area is a great way because you yeah. can even just say, oh, you know, isn't it great? They've got such a selection of tea. You're just yeah. trying to find something I that opens open, somebody yeah. up, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I also uh, noticed at an event I was at just a couple of weeks ago in Edinburgh, somebody actually actively sat independent from everybody else. All right. And I personally Ooh. felt drawn to go over and now engage with that person. Yes. And I actually had the best out of everybody I met at the event. That was actually my best conversation, which really surprised yeah. me because I thought, why are they sitting there? And I think they obviously felt uncomfortable approaching people and thought, well, you know what? I'm going to acknowledge that that's something I feel. I'm going to sit down and hopefully somebody who's the right personality will now come along and, and engage me. With yourself. But yes. the thing that always uh, worries me most is this moving away. And I think Pam's really hit it on the head. It's <laughs> such a nerve wracking thing because, <laughs> you know, you've gone to an event, there's 15, 20, even 100 people there. You didn't go there just to meet that first person yes. you said hello yes. to at the coffee. So what would you say to, to help us 
walk away? How would we how would we achieve that, Wendy? Well, uh, well, again, I think there's a lot of unconscious cues there, right? And you can break rapport by inducing some unconscious cues. And again, I'd be looking at the the feet positioning, Pam. Oh. So <laughs> one of the one of the things that I encourage people to do when you're engaged with somebody, you generally find their toes are pointing towards each other. Ooh. I don't know what Nicola's doing here. <laughs> oh, whoa, she's got her boots here. She's describing with her boots, Pam. So you've got a visual okay. for later. Oh. Um, so when you're engaged with somebody, you tend to find their feet are facing each other. Um, when somebody's a bit bored or slightly disengaged, you might see that one of their feet is pointing away from the conversation. Like this, you mean? That's, That's exactly what I mean, yeah. Nicola. Thank you. <laughs> it's very odd to have a pair of boots sitting beside me here. Um, so one of their feet might be moving away from the conversation. Now, unconsciously, that means that they're ready to move to the next person. And the people with whom they're speaking unconsciously receive that. And it tends to break the rapport. That's a subtle way of actually breaking rapport. <laughs> Thank you, Nicola. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, however, also, Pam, I believe in taking the elephant out the room and actually being very, very upfront and saying thank you very much for um, the engaging conversation. However, bearing in mind it's a networking event, I'm very keen to meet as many people as I can. Is it okay if I move on to um, across the room or go and meet uh, somebody I've just seen across the room? And there are other subtle body language things uh, that you can use, the eyebrow twitch. So by using the eyebrow twitch while you're in a conversation, it means to the people you're speaking that you've recognized somebody else in the room and you're wanting to go and engage so what, with them. What do I do with so my eyebrows? Do, <laughs> so you're at a networking event and you raise your eyebrows and to the people with whom you're speaking they recognize you've noticed somebody else in the room and that you're wanting to go and engage with the other people so there are there are many different cues unconsciously that you can use that are very powerful it's interesting because i find that it, you know over the years you get so used to speaking to people from all sorts of different backgrounds yeah. it's eight, you know you're able to make conversation and try and get i love getting people onto their favorite tv show something that's away from work completely. absolutely and everybody absolutely. just relaxes and we can all talk about um love island or west wing or something love like island <laughs> nicola <laughs> you're showing us up right. <laughs> it's important to understand your audience the news, the news, the news. Um, but I, but I then I personally find it really hard to walk away, and I yes. think I'm really, I definitely give all the positive signals, yes. and I'm not very good at giving the negative signals. Yes. Um, mm. But what I, somebody did give me a tip, yep. which was they said if you feel uncomfortable walking away, that what you can do is take that person with you. Yeah. So perhaps after a few minutes or ten minutes or whatever period, you might say, "Do you know anybody else here?" Perhaps you might be able to introduce me to them and then or yep. or oh I just see there's somebody new joined. Shall we go over and yes. say hello to them? Yes. And that way you're hmm. you're in, moving on to the next person, but that person has yeah. the opportunity to come with you so yeah. you don't have to feel like you're abandoning them. Because I wonder if I if in my case anyway, I think, gosh, if it was me who was being left behind, I might feel rejected. Yes. And they're yes. apply that to these other people. But maybe they're actually delighted I'm walking away. <laughs> I think that's a really good point. If you're conversing just with one other person, it can feel rather, um, what's the word, uh, rude, if you like, yeah. in a way, to walk away, thanks very much, I've got what I need and now I'm moving on somewhere else, or I'm not really interested in you, so I'm moving. I think what you've just said is very important, so that they don't, do, don't feel that sort of disengagement, you're not leaving a bad taste in their mouth, because mm -hmm. obviously in networking you want to get as uh, many relationships developed as mm -hmm. possible. Um, so there's some tips, Pam, with regard to if there's one person you're speaking to or if it's more than one person you're speaking to that you could use, hopefully, that will help you in your journey with connecting as many people as you can and developing your business in the direction you want to. I said that's really great. Can I just ask something else, which is a, a technology sort of question? Yep. Um, I, I most, you know, when you're out and about these days, a lot of people that you see have their mobile phones, like they're looking at them, looking things up. Yes. Is it? Is it bad form to approach them or do you think that it's just that they're doing that because they're trying to occupy their time I, I'm not really sure sometimes about what to do about that yeah Karen I, I would say that that's because that person is feeling just as self-conscious as the rest of us yeah and rather than stand there looking and observing the room and saying I'm here without anybody they're then getting on with their emails it's, it's something to give them as a soothing it's a bit yes. like a soother a yeah. pacifier um, and invariably they're quite delighted to be interrupted if they were that, mm. if they didn't want to be interrupted, then they probably ought not to be at the network. Or they'd leave the room. 
yeah. if they were wanting, if it was something important that they were on their phones for, Pam, mm -hmm. they would probably go out of the, the, the venue and have the conversation or do the business outside the room. So I think Nicholas hit the nail on the head there. It's also, you can use it as an intro. Because yes, the fact yes. is they're looking at their phone. You say, oh, learn, you know, anything interesting going on in the world out there? Yeah. Or, um, gosh, it's mm -hmm. so hard putting in your emails when you're always out and about. It allows you to talk about something else rather than the standard questions. What business, what job do you do? And what business do you work for? Yeah. Which is really hard to build a, net, a so relationship. So networking per se, Pam, I, I'm not a, a, a traditional networker. I think the idea of going to a network and telling people your name, telling people your business is not necessarily the best way to engage and get rapport and relationships building. Mm. Um, but what Nicholas just said with somebody on the on the phone, I think going up to them and preempting it and saying, isn't technology great these days? You can be, be connected not only like we are today face to face, but you can also make connections virtually so much more easily. So I hope that's been helpful, Pam. Oh, yes, it has been very much. Safe. And I'll make sure the next time. I, in fact, I'm out tomorrow. So I shall put the thing, wear my nice shoes. So that when that <laughs> people look down at my feet to see. <laughs> they won't see my scruffy old or trainers. <laughs> well, probably they'll not be looking at your feet. You'll be looking at other people's feet. So you'll be OK. <laughs> Great. Oh, that's really useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, Pam, lovely to speak to you. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. 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 You know, I was wondering if we could just explore that a bit further, because um, for me, an, an example of where this is also an issue of the walking away is dinner parties. OK. And I'm wondering, somebody had said, um, I think it was somebody quite famous recently, that on if we allowed our children to follow their instincts, yes. they would stay away from some really dodgy situations. But because we teach children to be so polite to people who their instincts tell them are dodgy, we encourage them to stay talking to people that perhaps aren't right for them. Yes. Um, and you know, whereas an animal, a dog, if they meet somebody they think isn't dog friendly, they tend to immediately back yeah. off. But we tend to say to a puppy, "Oh no, no, you should say hello." Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm wondering. So I, you know, you're at a dinner party, mm -hmm. and you know, you've been told to be polite. You've mm -hmm. told to ask everybody all about their life, and we can you can spend half an hour talking to this one person, but you're not really conversing because what's happened is one person is facilitating the other one to tell them their life story. <laughs> Um, I'm sure I'm not the only person out there who experiences this and I, I wonder if it's because it's the same in dating isn't it where you go yeah. on a date one person comes away thinking it went amazingly and the other one was like oh my gosh it was so boring they never asked me anything yes how do you is it, is it are you an advocate for just show your show your emotions straight you know on your we, face this is quite a long conversation but human beings naturally we've got a seven second interval when you meet somebody that you categorize people mm -hmm. you automatically categorize them into four things unconsciously they're either you like them as so there's a friend thing um you don't like them so it becomes sort of predator mm -hmm. um there's more of a chemistry and there's a facial attraction and they feel part of your tribe which is more sexual sexual partnering mm -hmm. and lastly indifference and 70 percent of everybody you meet you are indifferent towards which is quite a high statistic yeah um so acknowledging that in business you will meet people that you particularly are not drawn to immediately as you would do at a dinner party mm -hmm. and knowing how to develop rapport with that situation so getting them from indifferent into friend so that you can have a business relationship there are techniques you can employ by developing advanced rapport which i do training on <laughs> Uh, but if I can bring you back, so, so the rapport bit yes. isn't the issue for me. It's, it's the fact is that they think there's a great rapport, and but I personally am not getting anything from it. And I don't mean business-wise. Sometimes it's just socially. If you if you do too, I guess if one partner does too much of anything, the other partner in the conversation can take a back seat, and it becomes easy. Is there any? I, I think that's just a question of being more um, self-aware. So if if you're bored by somebody talking at you, mm. it's I would bring the elephant out of the room. I would actually start a conversation or I would stop them from conversing continually. I would bring in something to the conversation. If I'm bored by them, I would move away by subtly saying something. Moving my feet. Yeah, moving feet <laughs> or, or just there's lots of additional cues. Yeah. Um, if it's that I want to have a component within the conversation, i.e. I want to get engaged, but they're not letting me, I would break them by speaking, by saying something 
do you know that you're speaking a lot or do you know that you're very uh, you're very interesting but you too you do talk quite quickly um, just breaking the conversation you, you know mm. uh, you, my brain's taking a long time to catch up with you I do have a friend that talks excessively sometimes and I don't know quite how her brain keeps up with her mouth and I have to sort of say my goodness you're so quick thinking uh, you're, you 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 manage to talk so quickly how on earth does your brain keep up, keep up with your thought process? I feel there's time for another training course. Yeah. Almost, I think. <laughs> yes. But it's all about dinner party etiquette and, and how to educate those who, because I think there's yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be explored yeah. there. Human communication, it's, it's a big topic. Yeah. Great. So I, th I believe we've got another caller coming in, Nicola. We do. Good morning, Corporate Conundrums. How can we help you? Hello, my name's Tim Trafford, and I've got a question for you. Great, that's super, Tim. What can we help you with? I've been asked by my managing director to prepare a strategy document for my department in the company. I'm keen to engage with my team, which is about 25 people, the executive and other support functions within the organization in order to develop the strategy and get the best idea from other groups what that strategy should be. Do you have any thoughts or ideas as to how I could most effectively do this? Or, and the second question is, am I making a mistake by sharing the problem? Right, okay. Um, shall I start? Do you want to start? Sure. I'll start, okay. So my first, protocol and advice would be, Tim, to ensure that you are very familiar with the vision of the organization and the values, uh, the wrap around about how you're then going to design the strategy. So certainly I, I think before doing anything else, that's your first protocol. Uh, Nicola, what would you add to that? I think it's a great idea to engage the team and the wider stakeholders to be able to really have a strategy that people are willing to implement. But I think initially, this. I would take a step back and say, what do I see as the vision for my strategy for my department or my area? So that you then are going into those conversations with what we call a straw man, which allows the discussion to be led in a particular direction. I think you've got 25 people asking 25 people how to um, even make a cup of tea, you're gonna get 25 different answers. answers yes. And so to ask 25 different people what the strategy should be for your area, you'll also likely get 25 different answers. And sometimes it could be quite hard to then at some point say no to 24 of those people. So sometimes having a, a straw man that then at least encourages the conversation to go in particular directions in line with that vision yes. that you've mentioned there, yes. Wendy, might help. But I think it is key to engage the team. Absolutely. And there are a number of different methodologies you could actually impart with the team or use to get the team buy-in. And one technique that I've used to actually develop a strategy with the uh, Scottish Artistic Society it was at the time, was um, the art of participatory learning using a World Cafe, Tim. After having designed your question or your, your straw man question with, with the direction of where you're wanting the strategy to go, to then get people sitting around a table and put in a World Cafe type discussion. And you will get a number of different answers, but you can actually then sort of bingo chart, if you like, the common themes and it allows them to feel that they're part of the organization, they've bought into being one of the pieces in the jigsaw and they see the vision and the values of the organization overriding where their part is within that jigsaw, if that helps. No, that's, that's really useful. Um, I, I think it's how one engages with, with the team it, it is always challenging. Um, the old adage that a problem shared is a problem solved um, is, is not always the case because everybody has a, a view on what they yes. believe the, the strategy should should be and and sometimes I, I feel it's almost better to say here it is mm. you might not have had any ownership in the yes, generation indeed. of that strategy yes. but at least you can do something in a short time frame because sitting down in a sort of world cafe sort of environment or some kind of a way day takes a lot of time and effort and doesn't necessarily always result in in alignment the, but the the idea of the world cafe is to be creative 
and through that creativity find the best solution. Sometimes having chaos, you get better creative solutions at the end of it through the chaotic pathway type uh, of environment. One other thing that I'm curious about, Tim, is your language terminology. Uh, so you've been asked to develop the strategy and you're seeing that as a problem before you've actually gone any further because twice you've said a problem shared is a problem solved. And I'm curious about that. Um, perhaps that's something for you to think about at a, at a time yourself. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Nicola. I, I do agree with that, but I'm wondering if perhaps we could just to give you something to move forward with just now, Tim, mm -hmm. is perhaps there's a bit of a compromise. I think as a, as, as a leader, as a manager, your team look to you for direction. Yeah. And so the answer is not to give them the problem. The answer is to give them the direction. Yes. Um, and that that's the bit of thinking that you need to do in advance. And perhaps there's a couple of key people within the wider organization that you might want to float your ideas with and get some feedback before you then finalize putting something in front of the team. But then I would be leveraging this concept of World Cafe or even just consultations yes. where you're giving people a specific nugget within that strategy that they can then influence. And that might then allow the team to feel that they own it and that they can influence the implementation, but that they under they can I guess, relax and enjoy the experience knowing that you as the leader have set the direction. Absolutely. Um, good, good, good reply, Nicola. <laughs> Very concise. Uh, I, I, Nicola, I, I, I like that. You, that is good. That's not something I've done before when developing a, a strategy. I think I, I will, I'm resolved now to, to actually go and pick off maybe a couple of the executives and see if I can borrow 15 to 20 minutes mm -hmm. to understand where they're going yes. and what they want out of this and then develop a, a straw man as, as you've called it. Um, and it's not a fait accompli because it's, it's a, a document or, or a presentation on which uh, the, the whole department can buy into uh, or amend as they see fit. Yes. Yes. Great. Well, we hope that's been helpful, Tim, and we will look forward to hearing about your journey and developing the strategy rather than the problem. And uh, keep in touch and let us know how it goes. That's been very helpful. Thanks very much, Thanks Nicola. Guys. Thanks very much, Wendy. OK, bye. 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 Yeah, interesting. interesting. I, the use of language is yeah. interesting because I think there's a heaviness the minute that you mention things as being a problem rather than something that you're moving towards as a solution for the future. Mm -hmm. And that in itself um, inhibits your creative thinking ability to create the straw man in a way which is positive and will in, embrace others to come on board. I wonder if um, part of this is that if you enter an area where you're really experienced and you know exactly what you're talking about, mm -hmm. you'll already have a vision and a strategy. It's a part of yes. your being. Yes. Whereas if somebody, if it's an area you've maybe just recently moved into, maybe because a lot of businesses, they like to move their directors around from one area to another to give them more experience before moving them up to perhaps managing director role. Indeed. But it Indeed. means you can find yourself, maybe you're a marketeer and you're finally in operations. You don't really have a feel for what the strategy should be in that area. Yeah. And I wonder if that perhaps then is seen as a problem which is fair. And then you think, well, actually, who's the experts? They're the people in the team. But as soon as I let them have access to this information, this discussion, they could take him off in a direction he had no intention of going. Absolutely. Um, so Absolutely. perhaps the, the word problem maybe is actually reflective of how he feels at this in stage. The organization. Yeah. And it may well be as well that he doesn't understand the vision and the values of, of the overall vision and values of the organization and therefore feels a little bit isolated. And he's sort of been thrown a Thrown a yeah. bone to. Especially when you're new and somebody gives you, uh, the, your new boss asks you to do something, you feel you have to say yes. Yes. But actually, probably a year down the line, you might say, well, I'm not really sure we're ready to do a strategy because I'm not sure we understand what your vision is, Mr. or Mrs. Boss. Yes. Um, indeed. But initially, indeed. we've taken that problem away and now he sees he's taken a problem. And as you say, then, has he then going to cascade it to the, yes. the rest? And it team? becomes a sort of uh, a rolling stone gathering moss in a negative way rather than a, a something people can see and buy into. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Right, so I think we've got our next caller. Good morning, Corporate Conundrums. How can we help? Hi there, it's Elisa calling. Morning, Elise. Hello. So how can we help you today? Well, that's a good question. I'm calling to ask you about how to deal with burnout. Because um, it's not just myself dealing with it, but it's my husband and myself in business together. 
And um, in addition to that, hubby's working uh, a full-time job elsewhere, okay. and he's commuting two hours a day. So it's pretty pretty heavy going. Okay. Uh, it sure. sounds, and um, I think burnout affects so many of us, and we tend to not spot it. So first of all, well done you for actually flagging yes. to, to yourself and to your husband that this is an issue, because um, that mean, it now means you can do something about it. Um, I would assume in this situation, you've mentioned your husband's got a, a full-time job. Does that mean you've also then got your own businesses as well? Yeah, we're yeah. running two, two digital businesses on top of my husband oh commuting my. two hours a day. Mm. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. So it's, and it's one of those situations where those businesses are just getting going, so we can't actually say it's time for husband to to leave number one job. So it's kind of like all hands on deck at the moment. Okay. I would, I would say that uh, we have to remember that we only have one life and that we're only on this planet for a certain amount of time and that what matters in life is being happy. Yeah. Um, and that also sometimes can go to the back burner when we've got so many things that we're trying to achieve. Um, and I, for me, would say that you, it's important to take stock and take this real opportunity to say, what am I feeling happy today? And am I in a position mm -hmm. to be able to feel happy tomorrow? Or if this burnout is causing me that problem, and it sounds like from what you're saying, the fact you've called us, it sounds like you're at that stage of saying, well, you know what, actually to maintain this on a daily basis for the foreseeable future is going to be a negative in your world of being happy. Um, I one of the things that gets us happy, of course, is about being healthy. And if we are burned out, we can't be healthy. Yeah. yeah so I yeah. think it sounds to me that we're back at absolute first principles, which is about getting some sleep, yes. getting getting time for yourselves and remembering why you're married and remembering why you decided to go on the journey to launch your businesses and to achieve certain goals. And then to put it slightly more into perspective and maybe allocate an amount of time and then the rest of the time is for something else. I think um, I know often I'm saying that no matter how quickly I get through my today's to to do list, there's always going to be another full to do list tomorrow. You know, when we run our own companies, the to do list continuously fill up. Yes. But indeed. what we can do is we can control the ticking off of those things on that to do list. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like you're very motivated people to have taken on so many things. But perhaps we just need to reduce the number of things on that to do list per day. Um, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. there's there's no because you never finish it's not like um filling a shelf and once you fill the shelf that's it now full for the rest of the year indeed um, indeed i um alice are the you said you've got two digital businesses running in parallel to your husband's full-time job are the two digital businesses associated with each other or are they different businesses they're completely separate right so yeah have you done as nicholas said your priority of what is important what's feeding your marriage your souls and yourselves in relation to what you work at yeah i think so i think the um you know i, I think that as what you're saying about the to-do list is uh it's always growing and it never ends and uh it's just finding that happy balance and i i think the thing is that we took on this work um, ultimately for financial freedom and to be able yeah. to do it anywhere in the world basically so it's that underlying drive of trying to at least do what we can to get that up and running for the future yeah but ultimately we've got to take care of right now otherwise yes. there will be no future so and you, you have that. you have finite resources that's your first thing you have to think we have finite resources to be able to achieve what we're wanting to achieve. In the in that process, we have to firstly put our health at the top of the list because without putting your health at the top of the list, everything else is going to crumble underneath. So exactly what Nicola says, when you're making that priority in your life, health is at the top. So how can I address my own health issues, my own um, sleep, if you are or not, are not sleeping with both of you? What do we have to do to ensure that happens so that we have got more hard drive in our brains to be able to deal with all the additional things that are going on in our life so it's very much a question of putting what's important at the top of that list and then working everything else into that and not being driven to continually react to what you've put into your lives with regard to business so i, I think it's very much 
Nicola said, prioritizing what, what your goals are, what your visions are, and how you achieve that, putting your health at the top. Because if you continue on the line that you're going at the moment, you will eventually not have those finite resources to be able to achieve what you want. Um, yeah. and, and sometimes it's back to front because when you're in the middle of something, you can't step far enough back from it to see the way forward because it's just you're in the jungle. You can't see the wood for the trees. I think Very sometimes, sometimes we also measure success in the goal. Yeah, um, but actually it takes, it's definitely taken me quite a time to come back to actually what matters is, am I happy today? Am I, or, and happy yeah. doesn't have to be joyful and jumping about. Yeah. Um, am I feeling like I got something out of life today? Um, because each day really counts. And I think it's often you hear about people who've gone through some traumatic event who finally get the message. Yes, and I, indeed. You know, indeed. It's so important yes. for us to try and get that message. And I know with our you know, children and families, we're always trying to say, do what works for you. Do so, so I think you've, the fact that you've identified running your own business is something that's important to you. Mm -hmm. Then that, I would assume, gives you an element of happiness. Um, is it? Are you? Is there an element there about the whether to be uh, full time for another company and or running the businesses? <laughs> Excuse me. There will be, but at the moment, um, yeah, at the moment it's kind of all hands on deck. Yeah. So at, at the moment we're just trying to go. Well, what can we do ourselves? What can we ask other people to do? Because yeah. uh, you know we're sitting down and looking at something and just drawing a blank and knowing that yeah we're just beyond dealing with this well you, you um, hit the nail on the head there Elise because delegation and finding somebody who can maybe support you um on the journey with areas within the business that you are less um experienced in and that you'll have less tools in to be able to do what you want to achieve so you know finding those um through networking those people that might be able to help you and you could delegate to is very important and the thing that I'm, I'm very conscious of is when it's your baby you're both you and your husband are probably not likely to say well perhaps this is something that somebody else could do for us or that somebody else could maybe come in and help us with it may not be that you have the finances to be able to pay somebody but you might have um, support in other ways from gateways from business enterprises from Scottish enterprise from all the different um, business help advisors that are around that might be able to give you more support than perhaps you're aware of and I think letting go is something you keep in your brain all the time so letting go of things that aren't really important but because you're in the jungle you can't necessarily see what's a priority and what's not a priority I wonder if um, if just getting some distance and it's I'm thinking of the concept of a holiday, not necessarily a financially expensive holiday, yeah. but a, a holiday from the business and um, literally taking a not two days out or a week out if you possibly could to to step away because yeah. our businesses do keep going. I know we always have these deadlines and if we don't get something to a customer or we don't make the new product design or we don't launch our new website, everything will stop. But in reality, most things will stick around for a yes. couple of months. Um, perhaps just finding a little bit of time to yourselves to get a bit of perspective might help with that prioritization. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think we just came back from Ibiza. Oh, really? <laughs> But I, I think I do key right into it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wonder then if that's an interesting point. Is it fair to say that because after having the break, did it feel quite overwhelming when you came back? Um, I don't know if it's it's always been feeling overwhelming, and I think this this break is the first break I've had in around ten years where I've wow. not been on my mobile phone oh, sitting well at the pool working. And I made a conscientious decision to leave it in the hotel room most of the time. Oh, good. So, I, um, one of yeah. the other things that occurs to me, Elise, it's 10 million times more difficult when you are in business with your partner because there is far less downtime. So, that yeah. precious time you have within a relationship is eroded by business speak. And I think it's essential that you map out times for date nights, for times. When you don't discuss the business because without doing that you're again just reinforcing this constant place of we've got to we've got to we've got to we've got so much to do and living and working in that environment means that both of you never get a chance just to step back and think oh right let's not talk business let's go out to the movies let's go and do something because in recharging your batteries in that way it allows you to get more brain clarification the next day for work 
And I think that's really key and really important, having the time to embrace your relationship, not your working relationship, your loving relationship as man and wife. Yeah, well, I hope true. you've got a few ideas there to help you on your uh, journey. Yeah, well, thank you very much to both of you. And I love what you're doing. It's great. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Elise. Bye. Have a great right. day. And yourself. Bye. Bye, Bye for now. Bye. So I think we've actually got our next caller come straight in. All so right. Let's move straight on to them. Hello. Hello. Good morning, is it? Yes, we're still in the morning. Good morning. Hi there. Hi. And um, yes, I'm calling. My name is Kelly. I'm calling from a local authority social work team. I'm the manager uh, of a team that I've worked with for many years. But uh, I just really wanted to ask you some questions about some changes that we're going through from a sort of upper above policy directives, and it's having quite an impact on my team. Okay. Okay. Um, I won't name the local authority for obvious reasons, but. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the integration agenda that's been taking place over the last two or three years in health and social care. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yep. okay. So basically the way that's been playing out is there's a lot of uncertainty. I have worked, as I said, with a really successful team for quite a long time, but because there's going to be an integration of health and social care budgets, that's causing okay. a lot of knock-on effect. And, real insecurity amongst my team. Um, and it's been manifesting in people leaving the team, people going off sick, added workload for those that are remaining, and a lot of confusion about individuals' roles and purpose with respect to their health colleagues that they're increasingly having to work with and alongside. So it's, it's just a time of turmoil, really. And I guess what I'm wanting to ask is, um, Given that things are going to be going on for quite some time, this could take several years to really roll out yes. uh, and, and become a smooth operation where we're working hand in glove. And I guess I really need to find a way as a manager to just navigate that transition and continue to achieve the outcomes that we need for our clients. And because motivation is a bit low and there is a bit of confusion, I'm really wanting to, to find a way to integrate new members, to, to keep people uplifted, and, and really stay the course, I suppose, without losing any more members of staff. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, sure thing. I'm going to pass it to Nicola to start to kick off with. Okay, all right. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Um, Hi, Nicola. I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned about the, the delivery of service to your you know, key customers or, or groups. Yeah. In that, really, that's, you know, we enter a certain professions to do certain jobs, and in your profession, particular profession you're really impacting people and their lives and their quality of life and their health and well-being um, mm -hmm. and for me that is the, that's the key and that's to keep the focus there it's very easy for all of us in organizations to become uh, distracted I guess and, and taken away from the focus of what it is that we're really there to deliver and I feel that in order first of all there's a duty of care where you have a level of service you're trying to uphold and I think yeah. sometimes in these changes we say to the management above us okay we'll manage but sometimes there's a point you have to get to where you can't manage and they need to know that message so i would encourage you to consider where is that point is actually the workload that you're all being asked to cope with in these changes something that is actually manageable and deliverable because your duty of care to yourself your own ta staff and of course your customers is paramount yeah. and if there's a situation where you can't provide that level of care that needs to be escalated very quickly sometimes we feel under pressure to keep going and as a result the level of care for ourselves and our customers Lord. reduces and then we mm. can't do anything for anybody yeah. and then eventually it's like a year later the message gets up the line and they go oh well, we never meant for that to happen so do escalate yeah. early if you find yourself in that position but secondly i think most of the i would imagine most of the people who got into that line of work did it because they wanted to make a difference and so yeah. the motivation comes from being able to make that difference yes and so try, keeping the team focused on what they're really there to do is what really yeah. matters and trying to, in a way, absorb, if you possibly can, some of the organisational changes in your own job rather than cascading that to the, the team. Yeah. It can be very oh, difficult in these changes. That's a good that, point, actually, yeah. um, because I think we're a very close team and because we all are very good in talking to each other informally and as a social work team, you have to be really close. Yes. It's very easy to have a moan uh, just because it's, it's hard because we actually all as social workers feel that the change is good in a bigger sense but mm -hmm. the way it's being rolled out um the bureaucracy and the yeah. way things are being facilitated or not 
Yeah. It's frustrating for all of us, and I think it is easy for all of us to lose morale, and I, get, I suppose I have to set a model yes. of some sort. And I think the, the, the bigger the monster, and what I yeah. mean by that is when you, when you amalgamate two huge services, such as social care with um, health care, it becomes yeah. a much, much bigger system, and therefore Absolutely. the bureaucracy that's wrapped around about that is huge and it's it's identifying where you can make a difference within that bureaucracy knowing that there are certain areas that you can't influence because it's such a big big um i i use the word monster i i do use an analogy That's a good description <laughs> <laughs> well i i use an analogy it's a little bit when the police like when the police force is all merged um uh -huh. th the bigger the organization it becomes more like a tanker rather than a tugboat but yeah. within that, if, how I use the, the sort of thought process is if you can think of yourself as one of the tugboats pulling the tanker, so your team mm. as one of the tugboats pulling that tanker and that monster, within what mm. Nicola's just said, um, knowing what their, your, the driven passions are for the team as a mm. social worker, then you're, I know it, we talk about silos and not silos, you are in a, in a way um, a little team making a difference as a team within the monster rather than uh, uh, maybe monsters and a negative connotation but it's, it's just the tanker and the tugboat uh, yeah. tugboats can maneuver easily tankers yeah. very difficult to change direction but if you become yeah. one of the tugboats pulling the tanker then you have got some form of i think a particular um technique that you could implement and perhaps you already have considered is when we have team meetings, particularly around these times of change, the com team meeting conversation tends to be focused on the change. Yes. yes. And I, I would Very propose good. coming back to first principles of the job. So the first principles of the job are to service 20 customers per team member. Mm -hmm. Then let's come mm -hmm. back to that metric. Are we managing yes. to do that? Have we had yes. any positive uh, successes with yes. those customers? with those customers and um, let's talk about that let's bring those team meetings back to really what we all turned up to work to do yes and yeah. keep the motivation and positive and the feeling of success and maybe you have a focus once a month on somebody let's bring the focus back to the team and the yeah. customers and let other people yeah. worry about the, the wider picture and of course you as a manager can then also just subtly be keeping an eye on things and driving your team as a tug in the right direction but i think no and i love that metaphor thank you for that because it is about finding ways to get people to stay positive and have a vision of the, the good that they are doing yeah and i i do think we get lost in the sauce quite a bit because it's a high pressure situation it's frontline social work and sometimes meetings slip and i'm guilty of that simply because with so many changes in staffing we don't always have enough you know hands on deck to cover for everybody to have the luxury of our sort of traditional style of meetings where we all you know put down tools and come and, and have an hours in depth meeting and I know I really need to prioritize that more so and yeah. Um, yeah thank you you've given me some good food for thought great um, yeah yeah great. no I feel better at least talking to you <laughs> so that, that'll give me a little bit of a boost myself and um, I'll go back and think about how I'm going to put this into practice okay Kelly that, that's great okay. many many thanks for calling and, yeah thank, uh, we you. Wish thank you, you very much good luck okay. in the journey have a nice day bye-bye bye-bye for now bye-bye yeah, bye-bye bye-bye it's so easy for like the coffee coffee machine gossip and to negativity to, to, negative and it just builds yeah. and it builds and we can spend all day discussing what may or may not impact us yeah. in the future rather than actually getting on with the day job and it's one of those um conversations i've had myself where we're looking at organizational restructures mm -hmm. and you want to keep the team as involved as you possibly can yeah but the more you do, the more questions it raises for people. And in the end, what people want to know is how am I personally affected? How does my day to day job affect? How does my potential career affect me? And how much does I get paid? Is that going to be affected or yeah. my benefits? And it creates all this uncertainty. But the alternative is you go back to the old fashioned way where nobody mentions anything. And literally on Monday, you just tell everybody, by the way, your jobs have changed. And of course, that's very disruptive and yeah. upsetting for people. And it's trying to find that balance of keeping everybody on the journey but yeah. trying to keep everybody focusing on their doing their job it's really quite a difficult well, fear of the unknown you yes. know it's fear of the unknown and we are negatively biased as human beings anyway and if there's any fear aspects then it becomes viral and it's a little bit like chinese whispers people not quite sure where they fit with all those criteria that you just mentioned 
and it's almost um, unloading that and, and getting back to what, exactly what you said, the day job of what am I here to do and how can I influence that in the bigger picture? Uh, but that, that fear factor of change is always going to exist and it's um, offloading that or emptying or preempting that is crucial for any leader in that change environment. Yeah. So we've had four really good calls today. Quick recap, Nicola. Uh, we had Pam with her networking conundrum. Yeah. How to approach people, but also how to walk away from people perhaps you've uh, spent too much time with. And the boots. And the boots. And the boots. Um, Tim and writing the strategy documentation. How does he lead his team through that yes. journey, bring them on board, but not get sidetracked with too many day-to-day um, -day issues or perspectives? Problems. Problems, <laughs> yeah, problems. Um, we had Alisa. Burnout, prioritization of business, family, full time jobs, yeah. enterprises. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Kelly, who's really looking at managing her team through a time of quite significant change within her um, organization, social yeah. work, I think it was. Yes, it was the public sector migration of the health service. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I think that's uh, coming to the end of our podcast number three, new podcast number three. Indeed. And I think we could call it a wrap. We can we look out for our future episodes um, in response to feedback to our suggestion of doing a deep dive. I think our next episode is going to be a deep dive. What are we going to deep dive into this time, Wendy? Resilience. I resilience. think we, talk, we okay. talked initially about humanology. I think we'll do it on resilience. Uh, five, five tips. We'll give you a quick tip. Opportunity to use my power pose again, maybe? Definitely. Excellent. And hopefully you've been doing your power pose in the interim of before in this, our last podcast and this one today. So it's goodbye from her, Nicola, and it's goodbye from her, Wendy. Bye. All the best. Bye-bye for now.